Hey everyone, Pink Apple here, and we're currently sitting at number 1 on the North American leaderboard. Today, I'm going to be rating all of the Citric Order cards, giving you a high rank overview of what cards you should be taking and what's best to avoid. And we'll be starting out in the S tier with Scrying Globe. This is one of my favorite cards to see on the opening board, and in my opinion, is actually the second best 2 cost card in the game, just behind Luxury Export. So any card that has 2 gold on it is automatically attractive in the early game, but the thing that makes Scrying Globe so strong is this Toss 2 effect that we get on top. Toss is a very powerful ability in the first few rounds of a match, as it's going to let you cycle through all of those 1 gold coins we have. This gives you a really big advantage over your opponent when it comes to picking up those contested 6 and 7 cost cards like Plunder or Rally. The final factor that pushes Scrying Globe into the S tier is that it's one of the few early game cards that actually maintains its strength throughout the entirety of the match. It plays particularly well with purple decks in the late game, and also has great synergy with the Dreaming Cave, both triggering its 2 power combo and also letting you decide which card you draw with it initially. Overall, the card has very high impact for such a low cost, and this makes Scrying Globe an easy S tier. Now moving on to our second S tier card, we have Prophecy. Now I think a lot of the community doesn't understand just how strong Prophecy really is, because my opponents let me pick up this card all the time, and honestly, it's straight up overpowered. Cards that give 3 or more gold have insane value in the early game, and the high gold gains on Prophecy synergize so nicely with the tavern removal that's already built into the card. The way this effectively plays out is since Prophecy is giving you so much gold in the first place, you're typically always going to be able to afford anything you end up revealing on the board. So if big cards like Currency Exchange or Rally pop up, you're going to have priority on those over your opponent. Overall, Prophecy is an absurdly powerful card, and if you manage to pick this up in the first few turns, you can easily find yourself running away with the match. And now, for our final S tier card, as well as being my personal favorite card in the entire game, the Dreaming Cave. It's tough to describe just how versatile this card really is. I would go as far as to say, in all situations, no matter what deck or strategy you're running, your deck is always better with the Dreaming Cave in it. If you manage to pick up two of these, the card easily and strongly combos with itself, providing absurd deck control, as well as some decently consistent power generation. If you already have a strong deck, whether it's a purple combo deck, or if you're just rushing down your opponents with siege volleys and armories, the Dreaming Cave is always going to be the best option to add in those late game scenarios. The only negative thing I have to say about this card is that you really want to have at least one or two strong cards before picking it up, otherwise you could find yourself getting outpaced. That being said, if you happen to have a few strong cards already, the Dreaming Cave is the best deck control the game has to offer, and easily secures a slot in the S tier. Now for our first card in the A tier we have the Sigic Relic Master, but before we talk about the Relic Master, let's go over its unupgraded base version, the Sigic Apprentice. The Sigic Apprentice is a quite solid card, but I find it suffers slightly from just how slow it really is. Unless you possess a way to draw a card on the turn you play Apprentice, you're not actually impacting the board state at all. That being said, similar to the Dreaming Cave, this card really shines when you have a strong deck already. Now the upgraded Relic Master on the other hand grants an additional gold every time the card is played. This may not seem like much, but the difference between having no impact on the board versus having some impact on the board is really meaningful in my opinion. Overall, these are both relatively strong agents, and if your match happens to have the Sacrifice Patron ability available as an option, I find they become even better, being able to get 5 power on demand. We're going to be slotting both contract actions into the A tier. Now given that these are contract actions, I'm going to be rating them based on their best case scenarios, as if they're not good for your current turn, you can just opt not to pick these up. That being said, when these cards are good, they can be game winning levels of good. Being able to toss 3 instantly without having had to commit any cards to your deck is really strong in the late game. This can remove the RNG from your late game crow combos, setting up for some great finishing turns. You can also assure you're drawing that rally or armory in that final push to 40 prestige. Now the upgrade here only adds 1 extra power to the combo, which in most cases is going to be completely irrelevant. Now joining the apprentice in the B tier, we have Prescience. Prescience is a pretty reasonable card, but definitely falls a bit short when we compare it to Scrying Globe. In some niche situations, tavern removal can be more impactful in toss, 
However, the fact that you're paying twice as much gold when compared to Scrying Globe really hurts this card's viability in the early game. One of the better situations to buy Prescience in is on turn 1, if you happen to be player number 2, you can utilize the extra coin that you get to both buy Prescience and also use your treasury power in the same turn. This makes for a pretty decent turn 1 opener. Overall, Prescience is a pretty average card. It's not great, but it gives you some of that needed gold generation for the early game, and you can usually sacrifice it off once it starts to feel like a dead card in your hands. Alright, now moving down to the C tier, we have Sigic's Insight as well as its upgrade. I'm really not a big fan of Sigic's Insight, as I find tavern removal cards that don't also come with gold to be pretty weak. Additionally, if I'm looking for toss in my match, both the Dreaming Cave and Scrying Globe are just far better options than this card. So the only times I ever buy Sigic's Insight is if I intend to sacrifice it on the turn I draw it, or if I desperately need toss and just nothing else is showing up on the board. Overall, I just really find these two cards to be quite lackluster, and I don't think they have any clear strengths of their own. Given that almost every time I buy these two cards, I intend on sacrificing them immediately, I just can't justify putting them any higher than C tier. And lastly, we have Time Mastery, which is actually the only card maintaining its position within the D tier. To put it bluntly, there's almost no cases I would ever want to buy Time Mastery in this game. This card is extremely inconsistent compared to Scrying Globe while costing more. If you buy Time Mastery in the first few turns and then you don't land the combo once you draw it, it just ruins your ability to buy anything. At least the cards in C tier can be sacrificed for some decent power gain later on in the match, but sacrificing Time Mastery honestly feels like a waste of your patron power. The only time I ever actually pick this card up is if I know I'm guaranteed to lose the match normally, I just want to desperately take all the tavern removal I can, hoping to reveal a tithe on the board and maybe sneak a patron victory at the end. Alright, and we are back after having readjusted the cards to account for their power level within each tier. That about wraps it up for the rankings on the Sigic Order cards. I see a lot of the community saying they feel the Sigic deck is really weak, that they don't like to play any of the Sigic cards. And while I agree on the low end here, there's some really underwhelming cards, I can't overstate how strong these S and A tier cards are as supporting your win conditions. If you still have any questions about the cards, or disagree with any of my placements, let me know in the comment section down below. I'll be trying to respond to each and every one of you. If you guys found this insight helpful, please leave a like on the video, and subscribe if you want to keep up to date with the rest of the tier list videos coming out over this next week. I'm excited to start putting out even more Tales of Tribute content into the space, and definitely let me know what type of videos you guys would like to see aside from tier lists. Until next time, and may the divines bless your taverns with turn 1 armories.